Exploring Science Fiction, a monthly series of programs discussing various aspects of fantastic and imaginative literature. This month, science fiction as social criticism. Here is your host, Fred Lerner. Our guest on this program devoted to science fiction as social criticism is Frederick Pohl, one of the major writers of this form of science fiction. Together with the late C.M. Kornbluth, Mr. Paul has written Gladiator at Law and the highly regarded satire and advertising methods The Space Merchants. He has also written several novels and many short stories of his own and has edited the Star Science Fiction series of anthologies. At present, Mr. Paul is editor of Galaxy, Worlds of If, and Worlds of Tomorrow magazines. Perhaps it might be best to begin by establishing our terms. Mr. Paul, what do you mean by science fiction? What I mean by science fiction is perhaps not what anybody else means, because the term is one which is used very loosely, especially by me. To me, a science fiction story is a, a story which may take place in the future or on another planet or may involve some discovery of science, but whatever its thematic material is gives us a view of ourselves from an objective point of view, what Harlow Shapley calls the view from a distant star. How much of science fiction is written as social comment or social criticism? Well, to uh, some extent, I guess all of it is. Uh, there are very few science fiction stories which don't take advantage of the opportunity to look at ourselves through the mirror of science fiction, starting, with, uh, starting as far back as you care to go with Jonathan Swift and his... Uh, um, whatever, the Laputans in Gulliver, Gulliver's Travel. But uh, most science fiction, not, not most, much science fiction is written specifically in terms of extrapolating trends in present society, which I take it to be what you mean by social comment or social criticism. Who have been some of the more prominent authors in this category? Well, my former collaborator, Cyril Kornbluth, who until his death uh, was one of the finest writers of science fiction of any kind worked very largely in this field of extrapolating tendencies, looking at what will happen if. Um, I can hardly think of a major science fiction writer who hasn't done it to some extent. Clark has in Childhood's End. Um, Isaac Asimov in The Caves of Steel. Bob Heinlein in almost everything he writes. The list is almost endless. Kingsley Amos, uh, who wrote New Maps of Hell, one of the few volumes of criticism devoted entirely to science fiction, praised the book that you and Mr. Kornbluth wrote, The Space Merchants, and held it up as a very good example of science fiction's value as social comment or criticism. So I'd like to concentrate on this particular book a bit. Uh, could you s describe it for the benefit of those who may not have read it or heard of it? Well. The story, The Space Merchants, was written uh, as a reaction to some experience I had in the advertising industry. I worked for an advertising agency and later as a uh, freelance ad advertising copywriter. And it rather, it struck me with great force that the advertising industry was controlling people's actions in ways beyond the mere purchase of material. It was establishing patterns, habits reactions in people. And it seemed to me that if this tendency went on as it shows, showed then and shows now every sign of doing, there would come a time when advertising would dominate every act of our lives. The Space Merchants was written to show what sort of society this would produce. And uh, I don't know uh, how successful it was in terms of what its reaction on the advertising profession may have been. I don't think it reformed anybody. But I think that it has had a fairly large readership of people who are interested in that sort of question, including a great many advertising people. It was a rather terrifying future that the book envisioned with uh, a really low standard of living. Uh, could you describe that a bit? 
Well, in addition to uh, the basic concept of the advertising agency's omnipotence in molding society, Congress, for example, had become a sort of clearinghouse for advertising agencies and manufacturers. The book considered it probable that the present population explosion would continue without check so that there would be, I think, something like 20 billion people in the world instead of the present 3 billion, so that people would find it difficult to find a place to live. There were uh, persons were described as sleeping on the stairs of skyscrapers, uh, as sharing dormitory cubicles and uh, eating regenerated food, which was uh, food which had been eaten once already, uh, food made out of soybeans, out of uh, um, fungus and anything else that could quickly produce edible protein. Uh, this is not, was not necessary to the basic theme of the book, but it seemed to me an equally probable tendency, so we just put it in. Do you think there is any sort of a consensus on the part of science fiction writers in their extrapolations? Well, I think that most science fiction writers uh, take the easy way out in the parts of their extrapolations that aren't particularly interesting to them, so that, for example, they will almost all assume that the population trend will go on as it is, more and more people every year. I think they also assume the increasing urbanization of the world, more or less without stopping to consider it, because uh, it's a pretty logical bet to make. So that most futures are, in terms of enormous cities, uh, heavily populated with people living in each other's pockets all the time. But there have been stories written taking the other side of uh, all these trends, too so that there are very few people, cities have disappeared, whatever, uh, almost any sort of society you can imagine has been written about in some science fiction story. Well, what does science fiction have to say about some of the major issues of our time, things like race relations, war and peace? Well, science fiction has been rather deficient in this discussion of race relations. There have been a few stories, uh, but none that have had very much to contribute about the only original remark I can recall science fiction making about race relations is to draw an analogy between the uh, present civil rights riots and demonstrations and difficulties of one sort or another and the probable future difficulties that will arise when the first contact is made with an alien intelligent species. I should say if perhaps but I regard it as so probable that I'll say when the first contact is made. As for war and peace, uh, I can't count the number of science fiction stories that have either speculated on the results of war or uh, talked about possible ways of averting war. Are the optimists or the pessimists in the lead as far as science fiction writers go? I think the, the optimists are, no, I think the pessimists are in the lead numerically in terms of writers, but in terms of stories, the optimists are in the lead because there are just so many stories you can write about a world that's been ob obliterated by atomic energy. So that uh, however a writer may feel the betting odds lie, he's going to write about a world that has not been demolished, otherwise he has nothing to write about. Well, what I mean is, do, does science fiction uh, as a whole prophesy a pleasant future, a, a future uh, better than the present in which we live, or a worse one? I think that um, most of the more interesting science fiction stories have prophesied a an unpleasant future, what uh, uh, has been called an urban hell. The increasingly citified world, which is uh, congested and difficult to live in. But uh, there have been, I think that most science fiction writers, when they go beyond the immediate future, the next couple of centuries, see something better, more hopeful. I think that they regard the next century or two as a time of troubles, which will get beyond and then perhaps have something better. Well, one hopeful element in a lot of science fiction is that the individual, even if just a couple of them are seen triumphing over the general force of society and environment together against them. Good many uh, writers do do that in their stories, but I think I can think of many in which the individual has been squashed out flat, too. When a science fiction 
story sets out to criticize something, how effective is a criticism usually? Depends on the skill of the writer and uh, the kind of tools he has to work with, what sort of a story he is writing. I think that um, taking a book like Aldous Huxley's Brave New World as a science fiction story, which it is, pure and simple, uh, it can be said to have shaped the thinking of a good many people, considering what role they wanted to play in the sort of society he saw coming, the increasingly standardized, um, cre uh, uncreative, mechanical world that uh, he viewed as being the logical consequence of Henry Ford's assembly lines. But whether it has had at any time any effect on uh, actual political or social trends, I'm not prepared to say. I rather doubt that it has had a major effect. I think that all that the science fiction story can accomplish is perhaps to interest some readers in a line of thought they might not otherwise have taken up. I'd like you to discuss in the a light of what we've said such mainstream books, which are really science fiction, as The Child Buyer, as Brave New World, 1984, and things like perhaps Catch-22, which, though they may not be uh, science fiction by any means, uh, do have pretensions of being social criticism. I think they're all science fiction, except perhaps Catch-22, which is uh, farce or burlesque or satire, depending on the mood of the reader. But uh, I can't discuss them as being other than science fiction, because I regard them as science fiction. Brave New World, uh, 1984, were very much the same book, written a few years apart. Um, what they had to say is what is said in one way or another in science fiction magazines every issue. I think that they, they too have had the function of perhaps interesting some readers in ways of thought they would not otherwise have taken, perhaps more successfully than most stories labeled science fiction because they reached a, la a larger audience. There are a number of people who will not read something that is called science fiction, although they will enjoy it quite a lot if they don't know what it is. Do you think that uh, these particular books attained their popularity because of the fact that they were better than science fiction stories or in part because of the prejudice against science fiction? I don't think they're better. I think they are easier. I think that a uh, science fiction story of what I consider the pure type, the farthest extrapolation a, a writer's mind can reach to, is hard work for the reader as well as for the writer. It's necessary for him to give up some of his preconceptions of how people behave and what's coming next in a story, whether there will be a clinch and fade out at the end, whether the boy will get the girl, because the uh, characters that a writer like Cord Wainer Smith and Jack Vance and Poole Anderson and Philip Jose Farmer, to name a few, deal with uh, are not any longer quite human characters. They may have two legs and two arms and two eyes and one head, but uh, they're molded by different forces than the ones that work on us, and they don't react the same way. Any more than we work, than we react the same as uh, um, citizen of Augustan Rome, for example. Our interests are not the same as his, even though we're physiologically the same. Taking a particular subdivision of science fiction social comment, what does science fiction had to say about the religions of the future? Well, there have been a number of stories that have touched on religion, uh, sometimes just glancingly, as in uh, uh, Walter Miller's A Canticle for Leibowitz, or Robert A. Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land. There have been stories like Jim Blish's A Case of Conscience, which I have always thought was the perfect religious science fiction story, because it deals with what is the central problem that the immediate future may hold for religion, or at least for churches and that is what to make of a non-human intelligent race, whether to consider that it is born of Adam or whether to uh, consider it as outside of religion entirely or just how to fit it into the traditional beliefs. There have been a few others. Uh, Lester Del Rey wrote one called For I Am a Jealous Pe People, which was uh, perhaps a blasphemous story because it dealt not only with 
non-human creatures but with the identity of God himself as an alien creature and I suspect that there have been a number who, uh, which haven't occurred to me that should be mentioned. All in all, I think that religion perhaps has not been dealt with as frequently and as successfully as it should have been in science fiction, but uh, the exceptions have been sometimes remarkably good. Well, in what fields do you think that science fiction has been most valuable as a view from a distant star? I think that science fiction has uh, given all of us the idea that there is a future, and I think perhaps that's the first step to realize that uh, our children will not be the same as we are, that their world will not be the world we live in, and to try to examine what we do today in the light of what will happen to them because of it. I think that science fiction-minded people, what uh, are sometimes called time-binding people, people who look ahead are less likely to um, drop a match and start a forest fire or to uh, um, do anything which will foreclose the rights of future generations. I don't know again that I can say that any science fiction story or even the total of all science fiction stories will have had any effect directly on the future of the world, but I do think that it, they may have started some people thinking in seminal direction. What type of story filled this role before the development of science fiction? Well, I don't know that any type did. The story itself is a comparatively recent invention. Prior to the 18th century, it was almost non-existent. But uh, there was always a sort of fable or um, utopia or um, legend of a better or different place which I think can be said to have filled some sort of, to some degree the same sort of function. But prior to a few centuries ago most people never troubled to think at all. It was not, there, there was no science fiction literature because there was no literature for most people. Do you think that the form of fantasy, as distinguished from science fiction, has any particular value besides that of entertainment? If it has any, I can't see it. Uh, I distinguish between science fiction and fantasy by saying that science fiction is a story that could happen and fantasy is a story that could not happen. I think that there have been some wonderfully entertaining fantasies, but I can't think that any of them have uh, either educated or informed or stirred anyone's thoughts. All, uh, they, they work on the surface of the emotions and the glands. Mr. Paul, who reads science fiction? They seem to be uh, made up of several fractions. There is the um, in-group, the, the beat people, who all seem to have read a lot of science fiction. It's part of the jargon on San, Fran San Francisco and down in the village. And there are the electronics engineers who comprise probably a half of the science fiction readers in the, in the country. And there are a number of people who uh, somehow got started on things like The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and found something in it that touched them and went on to read other kinds of science fiction and found that it was worthwhile. But it's not a lazy man's field. Uh, in order to appreciate it, you have to work pretty nearly as hard as the writer does at least in order to get everything out of it that the writer intends you to, you have to work pretty hard. Many of the writers and fans that I've met, I might even go so far as to say most of them, uh, I've noticed have been people who have studied, that is, majored in college or whatever, in physics or chemistry or engineering, and in their spare time have become more or less authorities on history, sociology, anthropology, things of that nature. Could you comment on this? First of all, how true would this generalization be, and uh, what's the significance of it? Well, I don't know too much about science fiction readers as distinct from science fiction writers. Uh, most of the science fiction writers I know started out as readers, so I suppose in that sense they're fairly representative. But uh, one, if, if science fiction 
readers and writers as a class have one element in common, it is educability. They are able to comprehend and to learn so that it's not surprising that they should turn out to uh, be rather well informed in one or more given subjects. They have the capacity to assimilate knowledge. A great many science fiction readers and writers uh, are um, on the faculty of some university or other or are specialists in some discipline of science or another. Uh, every time I go to uh, a school, almost every time, uh, I discover that somebody on the faculty at least has read science fiction for a long time and wants to discuss it. Which, uh, incidentally, I also find when I go to radio stations, one of the engineers almost always has read science fiction and wants to discuss it. Well, here at Columbia, we've turned out uh, two science fiction writers, Isaac Asimov, 39, and Bob Silverberg in 56. Mm. And from the looks of the people here at the station, we probably have got quite a few more brewing. <laughs> what would you think are some of the best science fiction and fantasy stories of the past few years? Well, there have been a good many that I enjoyed quite a lot. Stranger in a Strange Land, I thought, was an important but flawed story. I thought that uh, it has much interesting meat in it, but the uh, story got out of hand about halfway through and should have been killed off early story by um, Jack Vance called The Dragon Masters, which I published in Galaxy a year or so ago, won an award at the Washington Science Fiction Convention Labor Day for being the best story of last year, and I think it just about was. That's a story which concerns a race of not quite human beings, but the descendants of human beings at some indefinite but remote time in the future on some planet which is not the Earth, but is not any more precisely located than that. It's a planet in a globular star cluster, but that's all we know about it. And there have been a good many stories by Cordwainer Smith and James Blish, and, um, oh, I, I'd, I'd hesitate to name two or three of them for fear of leaving out 10 or 12 that I should have named. Why do you think a person who ordinarily wouldn't go near a science fiction story should uh, read the field? I don't think a person who wouldn't ordinarily go near a science fiction story should read the field. I think that one of the things wrong with much science fiction is that it is being written for people who don't know what science fiction is. Uh, some of the large circulation magazines publish a peculiar mixture of science fiction stories, some very good ones and some utterly horrible ones, because the uh, audiences they aim at are not able to distinguish between the good and the bad. This isn't true of all of them, but it's true of some. I think that a person who is interested in in the future, who is wondering what's going to happen, should try to read science fiction. If it doesn't react with him chemically, if he doesn't enjoy it, that's life. It's too bad. But I don't think that anyone should be prejudiced against it because of the things like The Beast from 20,000 uh, Fathoms. Aside from the fact that uh, you make your living at it, what is it about science fiction that especially appeals to you? That's hard for me to say because I've been making my living at it for so long. I've been reading it since I was 10, which is now one-third of a century. I'm 43. And uh, I've been writing it since I was, uh, well, professionally since I was 17. I've been trying, I tried writing it when I was 12. It seemed to me that science fiction at that time had a role which, uh, when I first began reading it, had a role which is somewhat different from the one it now shows in that um, that was not a technological age in the early 30s when I first began reading science fiction. It was uh, an age not very removed from the late 19th century in terms of popular opinions, popular attitudes. So that the only exposure that some young people at that time had to the world of science was through science fiction. Now, of course, there's no way of avoiding technology and science. It's part of everyone's life all the time. So I'm not so sure that the same reasons would lead people to read it today. But there is this one element that science fiction possesses, 
which I think is valuable to anyone, and that is the freedom of expression that it offers to its writers and the freedom of experience it gives its readers. When would you say was the golden age of science fiction? Which one? I think there have been four or five, and I think we are coming into another one now. There was one uh, in the very late 20s and very early 30s, which I just came in the tail end of when things were happening, like Doc Smith writing the story The Skylark of Space, which opened up the whole universe to science fiction. Before that, it was a pretty pedestrian, close-in sort of thing. And... Uh, Stanley G. Weinbaum writing a story like A Martian Odyssey, which was the first attempt to show an alien as something other than a monster intent on devouring you. Then there was the John Campbell golden age of the late 30s when uh, people like Heinlein and Van Vogt and Del Rey and Sprague de Camp and a few others appeared. And there was another one in the early 50s when Galaxy began, when Horace Gold uh, first began trying to apply some of the standards of contemporary literature to science fiction. I think we're approaching something like a golden age right now, especially with some of the writers I've named, Jack Vance, Cord Wainer Smith, and a few others. What do you see lying in the future of science fiction? More and better science fiction. There have been some people who think that, uh, well, every time anything has happened, some friend of mine has told me that it was the death knell of science fiction. They said it about the about radar and the sniper scope and the atomic bomb. They said it about Sputnik and about now about the Gemini project. But there really is no limit to the material that can be dealt with in science fiction. Every little aspect of it that uh, turns into fact instead of fiction merely opens the way for more science fiction later on. When we meet an intelligent alien race a hundred or a thousand years, or maybe even ten years from now, what do you think their science fiction will be like? <laughs> Bug-eyed monsters from Earth. Would you like a prediction on when the first uh, man will walk on another planet, by the way? Oh. I have one going very cheap. Sure, we're always in the market for a good cheap prediction. Uh, I just thought of it the other day, and I'm willing to defend it. I think the first man will walk on a planet other than the Earth about January 10th, 1975. And I'll allow a six-day margin either way. That's because uh, I don't think the Moon Project is going to attain its 1970 goal. And because at that time the asteroid Eros will be making its closest approach to Earth and will be close enough so that uh, it's merely only another little step out of orbit to uh, match speeds with the asteroid. And once you're there, you can land on it and take off with no trouble because it has no gravitational field to mention. But I'll defend that, and I'll even take bets in small amounts. June 10th, 1975, you say? Well, January 10th. January 10th, 1975. Well, please don't spread that around too much. We'd like to have the exclusive story on it here at WKCR. <laughs> have you any other predictions for us? Uh, just a few that I'm saving to make bets on. <laughs> now, actually, I don't think a science fiction writer's business is to make hard and fast predictions. <clears throat> That's uh, something for the R&D boys. I think that a science fiction writer's business is to look at possibilities, not at uh, what is probably going to happen. Thank you, Mr. Pohl. Thank you. Our guest has been Frederick Pohl, co-author with the late C.M. Kornbluth of The Space Merchants and currently editor of the Galaxy Group of Science Fiction Magazines. This is Fred Lerner for Exploring Science Fiction. <laughs> Listening to Exploring Science Fiction, a monthly series of programs discussing various aspects of fantastic and imaginative literature. Exploring Science Fiction is produced by Fred Lerner in the studios of WKCR at Columbia College in the city of New York. For information about science fiction clubs and activities in the New York area, write to Exploring Science Fiction, WKCR FM, Columbia University, New York 27, New York.